waiting for some phone calls. And we ended up running across some people that we don't even know, you know? And that situation turned bad real quick. My, my homeboy got stabbed four times. Uh, and uh, somebody else got, ended up getting murdered, you know? What's up, everybody? How you doing? This is Big Pablo. Welcome to LA Times. We got a special story for you today. We got Danny Contreras. Man, he's going to have a story. He's been all over the place. But most of all now, he's on a mission for keys to life. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, man. So before we get going with this story, you know, my brother's a Raider fan. I won't hold that against him. So, <laughs> But there's a purpose to his jersey, man. I don't know if he'll share that later. But let's also uh, – I want you to take a second to please hit the thumbs up, guys. And please subscribe to this channel. And please hit the thumbs up, man. That tells YouTube you're watching this, and they'll spread it to other people, and they'll share it with others. And this message that needs to be heard could get out. So without further ado, we're going to get into Danny's story, man. And uh, I'm sorry if my video is lagging. As long as Danny's don't, that's the main point. His is nice and clear right now. So, Danny. Cool. We, we appreciate you coming in, bro. Uh, I thank you, man. Um, you know, it's been a little here and there trying for us trying to hook up. But where and how did you grow up, bro? All right. So, uh my dad's from Salinas and my mother's from Paso Robles, California. Uh, they hooked up and they ended up moving out to San Jose and uh, basically had me and my brothers and sisters. We were raised out in San Jose. Uh, my parents got divorced when I was about six years old. You know, a lot of a lot of violence in the home, a lot of gang stuff, a lot of selling drugs, just a lot of different things going on at home. Uh, my parents, uh, like I said, they got separated, divorced. Me and my brother ended up in Fremont, California. Uh, on the north side, over by, we used to live in an apartment complex across from Cabrillo Elementary and kind of just running around the streets. You know, my, my my dad would try to keep us in check as much as he could. We played little lead, Fremont football lead, baseball lead, a bunch of different stuff. Um, you know, there's still a lot of violence going on, still a lot of homeboys coming in. Uh, like I said, my dad uh, was originally from Salinas. Then uh, when we were growing up, a lot of the guys from Salinas had moved out to San Jose in that area so we would see all these guys who are homeboys and whatnot and uh they were basically like our uncles their kids were like like you know we we're like family kind of so uh you know just things things kept getting worse and bad uh, getting in trouble with school all the time fights authority issues with uh, people with my pops um you know kind of felt abandoned from my mom for she ended up taking off when they divorced married uh, a guy named Richard Diaz out of San Jose and they moved to Hawaii. So I felt like, you know, she took my little sister from me and, uh, and they, I felt, we felt abandoned, you know, so we were just with my dad. Ended up getting kicked out when I was 14 years old because of all the trouble I was in and my dad sent me to Hawaii to live with my mom. Me and my brother and sister all together in Hawaii, uh, you know, it just spelt trouble. And uh, it's only a matter of months before my mom was like, you're, you're going to go to Paso Robles to one of my, one of my aunt and uncle's houses. Right. And so uh, basically shot me to pass Robles, 14 years old, starting a new school. My plan was to run away and go back to Fremont. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, you know, my aunt, my aunt and my uncle, I love them, love them to death and my cousins. Uh, but my aunt was trying to change me and, you know, whatever it was, whether it was a dress code or she wanted me to dress a certain way and I didn't want to do those things. Uh, you know, we ended up butting heads a lot and I ended up taking off. I just ran away, and uh, my, like I said, my plan was to go back to Fremont, catch a Greyhound back to Fremont, and that didn't happen. I ended up staying there. I met some people there, started hanging out. Um, I ended up getting arrested for being a runaway. My grandmother came, got me, and she was like, just come live with me. My my grandma, my grandma didn't really have no rules, you know? Nobody nobody really listened to her. I mean, I loved her, but uh, I was like, all right, cool. I'm going to go live with grandma. I could do whatever I want. And... Uh, that's basically what happened, you know. I moved in with grandma. Where, where was grandma? Where was grandma at? Grandma was in Paso Robles, California. So, so basically, 
Matt, so you went out to – they sent you to Hawaii. You ran them up there too. <laughs> Everywhere you went, you were just causing trouble, it seems like, even at an early age, you know? Yeah, getting getting in trouble. What do you uh, think uh, – what do you think was the source of that trouble, man? Like looking back now, like let's not go forward, but looking back at 14 years old, what, what caused you to be that? Like being that little uh, troublemaker, man? Yeah, a little problem. Yeah, so I don't know, man. I, I tell them, I see it in my kids now. I think it might be in the genes too. <laughs> but but uh, you know, I think I think having the broken family uh, at a young age and experiencing all the violence that was in the home, the violence towards us, the violence towards my mom. I mean, there was always cops in the house, uh, not feeling loved and abandoned at a certain point. Like when my dad kicked me out, it felt like my dad gave up on me when I was yeah. fourteen years old. Like like you ain't coming back. He gave me a one way ticket to Hawaii. And I held so much anger and hatred towards him for, you know, I wouldn't even talk to him. I was like, fine, you kick me out, I'm not coming back. And then when my mom sent me from Paso Robles, I mean, from Hawaii to Paso Robles, I was like, you too, you know? I don't need none of you guys. I could do everything on my own. I'm going to figure it out. I don't need nobody, you know? And I got that that chip on my shoulder, that attitude, you know, that rebellious thing. And there's, there's a lot of things, you know, as a kid, you don't really understand what's going on in the home. Uh, you know, obviously, there's a lot of things that were not going on good. But there's a lot of things that you don't really understand, and you can you can act out on those perceptions, uh, yeah, and have a lot of emotions with those things. You know, a lot of yeah. depression, uh, you know, anger from not understanding things. You know, why why I got to get hit? Why am I getting spanked? Why am I getting beat up uh, for something I feel like I didn't do wrong? You know, a lot of unjustice feelings, uh, whatnot. Like I mean, it got bad. It got bad to the point where you know, when I was a kid, I used to tell myself that when I got older, I was gonna beat my dad up. You know. Um, so yeah. a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, man, I think a, a lot of people watching right now can relate to, I could relate, you know, if you knew my story and saying, I, I, I relate to that hundred percent, but I think a lot of people know that hurt right there, man, feeling abandoned at that age when you're supposed to be loved and a kid and yeah, you're running them up, but doing mom and dad, you don't give up, you don't give up on your kids, man. So, so now you're with grandma where you, you got to the point of the story, you're with grandma before you go on. Can you tell us about how was Paso Robles at that time, man? Was it a, you know, what was going on in the streets, man? You know, as you moved into this area, what was, uh, what was the vibe there? It, it's, it's totally different from the Bay Area. You know, it's very slow, you know, compared to the Bay Area or L.A. or other cities. Very slow, kickback. Uh, you know, there's certain groups there, here and there. Uh, but there's still, there's still some stuff goes on, you know. You, you can get busy if you want to get busy with certain people. Some people don't like certain people or whatnot, you know. Uh, there's, like I said, there's different groups, and uh, you know, I grew, I grew up in the Bay Area before I went out there, you know. So uh, we are, I had already been involved in certain things in the Bay Area, uh, in Fremont, and being around certain homeboys and stuff like that. And you know, you know, to to me, uh, being a Chicano was was being a Northerner, you know, and and so that's that kind of stuff was around me all day long. It wasn't a thought that I'm on this side or that side, you know, uh, when I grew up up North or when I was growing up up North and, uh, my little brother happened to be in Hawaii for a little bit. And I remember, you know, uh, he was hanging out with some Samoans that were like Crips or something like that. And I used to tell him when I was, I was a little kid, you know, so I got all this stuff in, in my ear and I'm getting indoctrinated with stuff. And I'm telling man, bro, what's wrong with you? You know, you gotta, you gotta represent that North, man. You can, we're freaking Mexican, we're Chicano, man. You gotta, that's what you gotta represent. And uh, so I was kind of getting brainwashed into that stuff. And at the same time as a kid, you know, I never even seen a Southerner before in my life. Never. Uh, I think when I was a uh, maybe seventh or eighth grade, there were some uh, some guys that I don't know if they were from LA or where they were, but uh, they moved in in Central Fremont, and. Uh, and two of, my, two of my homeboys had lived there. You know, we had our own little group. We got, we all had a, some of us had to get a fight. I had to fight one of my homeboys in the bathroom in Centerville Junior High to get in. Um, uh, and, you know, and I felt like a belonging there as like a family, you know, like I was searching for that. And, uh, and I remember going over to his apartment complex in Fremont, on Fremont Boulevard. And I'm seeing all these dudes, they're Southsiders. I ain't never seen no Southsider in my life. And most of them barely spoke English, you know, they were speaking Spanish and uh, they they didn't disrespect me or nothing when I'm walking there to get my boy. You know, we used to go to boxing practice uh, over in Irvington in Fremont and some other places. And, you know, there was like this this um, like teaching us that like they're no good. Southerners are no good. This, this and that. 
or they're you know they're the enemy and i'm thinking man they ain't nothing those dudes look the same as me except for they they can't speak they can't speak english too good you know like that's like hating my grandma my grandma my grandma barely speaks english like you know so i never really under quite understood that uh and when i moved down south you know um I was wearing red every everywhere I went. I had red because that's just all I knew, you know. I had red belts, <laughs> red everything, you know. And uh, when I moved down south to Paso Robles, you know, I kind of stuck out like a sore thumb because everybody down there is, is basically Southerner, you know. Uh, and there was a group forming down there already of a bunch of kids that were from Northern California and some from Southern California, and all they wanted to do was party, you know, and hang out and get high and do stuff. And and uh, I kind of took a liking to a lot of them. And, uh, you know, I could relate to them. And so they started a group, a neighborhood, and uh, they ended up asking me if I would get in. You know, they told everybody, whoever, wherever you guys were from in the past, everybody's got to drop everything they were a part of. And this is what we're going to represent, you know. And we're going to have each other's backs. We're going to be a brotherhood. This is this is a family, you know. We, would, we wouldn't say it was like a gang or anything like that. They would start off saying it was a party crew. Uh, eventually, it turned into a neighborhood, you know. Um, and that was uh, NSP. So, uh, you know, eventually living with Grams, I met all these guys. There's other groups that were there, you know, UB Tulo, NSP, uh, MP, PR, NCS, uh, R, uh, what was it? RTL or UP, I forget what, what the other names were, other neighborhoods. But, uh, you know, there was a group of us and we all got, we all got along, we partied, we did our thing and, and eventually turned into being the same stuff, you know, running around, fighting each other, doing, doing crazy stuff. Uh, you know, for me, you know, I had the attitude that somehow, no matter what, I'm going to make it. I wasn't, I never really did good in school, but I never applied myself, right? I was only went to school to hang out with my homeboys, who I thought, you know, were my family. A lot of them I still keep in contact today. Uh, some of them are like family. Some have went their own ways and do their own things. Uh, and so for me, you know, I started selling drugs. I had another homeboy that taught me. I kind of jumped jumped in there and, uh, and I figured selling drugs was going to be my way to being a man. How, how old were you at this time? How old were you we talking? Uh, when I when I when I started selling drugs, like really started selling drugs, uh, I was either, I think I was like fifteen or sixteen, maybe sixteen years old. You know, I was already messing around with all that stuff. I never was a drug addict, uh, but I would use drugs. I mean, I used everything. You know, uh, smoking weed, drinking, uh, LSD, uh, crank, meth. You know, all all, all that all that stuff. Uh, main thing was drinking all the time and smoking weed um you know so i started selling drugs i figured you know there there was certain image that i had of being a man you know you had to provide for yourself and your family and uh for me like the dope game was a stepping stone for me it was like i'll go make all this money whatever i can make out of this whether it's selling weed or selling cocaine or selling whatever and i can use that to start a business and then i can flip it and i can show my homeboys how to do it once i learn all these things you know and so that that was really what was driving my hustle yeah you know i think all the other older homeboys that would see me doing stuff ended up start taking a liking to me hey come over here youngster you know uh kind of testing me out and, and showing things and and i would push it you know and i would try to teach all my homeboys whoever wanted to get in whatever it was like look this is how you break this down this is how you break this kilo down this is how you break it up into bags you know this is how we count our money this you know, this is what I want back. This is what you get to keep out of this, you know. Uh, and I won't say I was no big time baller or nothing like, you know, just a little curb server trying to trying to make it big, you know, trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents real quick. Because uh, I thought that I thought that was the way to do it, you know, and uh, I was doing that. I was started transporting stuff from uh, Salinas to Paso Robles and uh, and going around to different areas, you know, uh, doing my thing. And, uh, you know, little by little, the same thing, getting in trouble with school. Uh, get kicked out of school. I was at the Paso Robles High School, uh, ended up at Liberty Continuation School, got uh, pretty much kicked out of Liberty Continuation School, was on juvenile probation, assault. I had assault with a deadly weapon. Me and my, my uh, homeboys uh, had jumped somebody who uh, who we said, who somebody told us disrespected, uh, you know, our clique or whatnot, and uh, went to juvenile hall for that. Did a couple weeks. My homeboy did a little bit longer. Uh, because he started saying crazy stuff, telling him he liked to see blood, and I don't know what he was telling him. Somebody got in his ear in juvenile hall, told him to say all this crazy stuff, and they ended up keeping him longer. You know, so I was on juvenile probation. I mean, I I had I had the system down. Like, you know, even when I was doing drugs, I would figure out when my PO was gonna come around. I would drink bleach, nice and ten pills, whatever, 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 sweat it all out, and give him a. Clean. I never peed dirty one time. 
on a drug test for uh, probation. I, and I had high supervision, juvenile probation. Uh, anyways, it got to the point I still kept getting in trouble, selling drugs and, and doing dumb stuff, getting in fights all the time. Uh, I mean, my ground was like, like basically you can't stay here no more. So I ended up moving into one of my homeboy's house in their garage, you know, kind of just sneaking in the back window. And then uh, I got a full-time job because, you know, I need to have a job. The reason why I got so many mo so much money here and there. And uh, my homeboy sister worked at the same place and she ended up telling me she seen me sneak in the window. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's I've been sleeping in the couch in the, in the garage, you know. And she, she, she went and told her mom and, you know, the parents – my homeboy's parents are great, man. They freaking took me in. They're like, don't even, you don't have to sneak in, coming through the front door. You know, you come and stay here every night. But I ended up leaving. Um, you know, I got kicked out of school. I mean, there was a bunch of other stuff. I, I think probation had told me that if I didn't get in trouble for like a year, that I would be off probation. So that was my whole goal as a kid. Like, I'm going to get off probation. I don't have to worry about this probation officer all the time, you know? And uh, I had not been in trouble for a year. I had been arrested like six about six or seven times maybe i've been to juvenile hall on different stuff and um i finally got to that point where I, I got a little bit smarter and started not doing dumb things i was still doing dumb things but not dumb things to get caught you know uh and uh it was my year my year was coming up and they weren't gonna let me out probation they basically told me after i got kicked out of the continuation school and probation like we're not gonna let you off probation until you move out of our county so i was like all right cool i'm gonna move out the county then and uh I, my, my homeboy Hugo came with his van and my other homeboy Joe. They came pick me up. We packed up whatever stuff I had in my grandma's and uh, they took me to Salinas to my grandparents' house. My my grandfather is a pastor or was a pastor of a church in Salinas, California, uh, Templo Mount Sinai. It's a mostly Spanish congregation with Spanish English. All the, all the people there know me since I was a little kid. So I was like, all right, cool. I'll just go to Salinas, lay low for a while. You know, keep doing my thing. I'll just come back and forth, drop some stuff off to my homeboys, let them sell the money. I can still make some money, you know, and I'll just kick it. And I'll keep a low profile. You know, I don't want to bring no heat to my grandpa's house. He's a pastor of a church. I want to show, at least show some kind of respect, you know. Uh, I would go to church every Sunday with them just because they made me, <laughs> you know, and out of respect. That's how we did. You got respect for your family, your grandparents. You do what they say, you know. So, all right, cool. I'm going to go to church. I'm living at their house, you know. So, I would go to church with them. Would I listen to the whole time? No, I wasn't trying to listen to none of that. Like, I'd be up there in the little kids, what is it, uh, Sunday school, you know, playing with the little kids, uh, you know, going across the street to the liquor store, getting gum or candy, coming back, and, you know, hopefully, hopefully it's over by the time I get back. I didn't want to listen to none of nothing, you know. Right before I left Paso Robles, uh, California, uh, and, and my homeboy Hugo and, and uh, Joe took me in the van, uh, my homeboy Joe's mom, Carol Morales, she came out and she gave us some, you know, some bomb, uh, Teresa and egg burritos, you know, and a Bible. And she's like, mijo, I want you to have this. And I was like, man, I'm like, I don't, I don't want that. I don't even need that, you know, but I took it out of respect for it. Cause that was my homeboy's mom, you know? So I said, all right, cool. Thank you. Appreciate it. Put it in my stuff. Not thinking nothing of it. You know, my other homeboy Hugo had gave me this book. I, uh, I've been trying to find it. I think this might be it. I got it on Amazon, but there's a, a thing on Tupac, right? We all listen to Tupac, and uh, and I was like, man, I'm gonna read that. I don't, I don't know if it was this one or the, another one that he gave me on his bodyguard and tell his Tupac story. And I, I don't ever read no books, you know. I don't read no books at all. So this was kind of like a magazine type book, and I was like, all right, cool. I took that when I got Salinas. You know, I hadn't been using no drugs. I didn't want my grandparents to see me like that. You know, I got a job. I was going back and forth on the weekends to pass Robles. You know. And uh, I started reading that little book about Tupac, and it talked about how when he was in jail, that he wasn't doing no drugs, and he had a clear mind, a sober mind, you know, and that uh, that he started reading the Bible, right? And then he had this that uh, only God can judge me tattoo because of uh, Revelations 20, I think it's 11 through uh, 15, you know, where it says everybody's gonna stand at the end of the world and be judged by God, and that's the reason why he got that tattoo. So I was like, you know what, man, if Tupac read the Bible, I'm gonna read this Bible. I'm gonna try to figure this stuff out. And uh, I cracked that Bible that my homeboy's mom gave me and I started reading it. And man, I read Matthew, Mark, I got to Luke and I was like, man, this thing, this thing is stupid. It keeps saying the same thing over and over about Jesus. I don't make no sense. This is why they keep repeating themselves. You know, this is crazy. And I said, you know, I'm gonna read that, that, that book that Tupac talked about uh, and why he got that tattoo. So I started reading Revelations 
And man, it felt like God started speaking to me. You know, uh, there was a lot of other things that have gone on in the past that I have been involved in and stuff like that. And uh, there were some people that I that I wanted to do some some uh, acts of violence that you cannot take back, right? And it felt like God started speaking to me, like, "Are you ready to die the way you're living right now? Are you ready to die?" While I was reading this book, man, it scared me. You know, I was like, "Man, I'm close this book, <laughs> put this book down," you know. Uh, and then it just it just spooked me, you know. So I my grandpa, you know, he's a pastor. He kind of seen me reading the Bible a little bit. So he got all excited. You know, he's over there trying to slide me Bible says, here you go, here you go, here you go. And I'm like, nah, grandpa, cool, cool, right? And so I closed that Bible. And there's some movie that I seen when I was in juvenile hall. I don't, I don't remember what it was, but it has this guy talking to God. And that's how, that's how I picture it. And this guy was like cussing God out. And that's how basically what I was like in that room in Salinas in my grandfather's house. I was like, why do you want me now? You know, what's going on? Like, just leave me alone, you know? Like I could feel like an audible voice towards me telling me, are you ready to die like that? Are you ready to go to hell? Are you ready to commit those acts of violence that you're going to do or the things that you've done? Are you ready for this? Because this is what's going to happen. This is what you got coming. And I was like, I'm not in my head. I didn't say it, but I'm not ready, you know? And it just spooked me. So I closed that Bible, man. I said, man, I'm not messing with this book no more. This, this, you don't play with this book, <laughs> you know? Uh, the next Sunday I went to church, my grandfather's church. You know, doing my normal routine, going in and out, going to the kids' ministry, going over there across the street, get some candy and whatever, go to the back of the church. Oh, no, I'm going to go to the front of the church, like third third, third pew back, whatnot. My grandmother's up to the front. My grandfather had invited this guy from Cuba, right? He's a missionary. Uh, I don't know, remember his name at all. And there was two other kids that I've known since I was little kids uh, that they grew up in Salinas in the projects. Uh, and their families went to that church, you know. And so they were there too, Carlos and Gabriel, that's their name. And uh, the guy starts talking, right? And he he says he points both of them out and me and tells us to come to the front of the church. And I was like, no, 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 I'm not going to the front of the church. And both of them went up to the front of the church. He's like, I want to pray for you guys. Like, you ain't praying for me. And I walked all the way to the back of the church, right? And all the churches turned around looking at me. My grandmother turned around looking at me, and I could see the the look on her face, you know, like like disgusted with me, like, get up there. What's wrong with you? You better get up there and let them pray for you. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm not getting up there. I'm not going to get up there. I'm cool. I went to the back of the church. The guy, he's like, look, you know Jesus? I was like, no, nah, I don't know Jesus. I don't need Jesus. You need Jesus, man. I'm good. And then he started pleading with me. He's like, look, dude, God got plans for you. He's going to give you favor with the youth, and he's going to do all. He started saying all these things, right? But I felt so offended that he put me on blast and everybody's looking at me, you know, and then take back. The last couple of days, I started reading the Bible a little bit, and I felt like God was speaking to me. So I felt like God was trying to reach me. And I went to the back of the church while well, this guy's pleading with me, and I remember saying a prayer in my head. I was not going up to the front at all. I was like, God, if that's really you, man, just let me sell dope for two more years and get all my money straight, and I'll go do whatever you want me to do if that's really you. And then this guy stopped pleading with me, and he left. Uh, church is over, you know. And uh, how, how, how old are you at this time? At that time, I'm 17 years old. Yeah, I'm 17 years old, uh, you know, and uh, one of my, a little bit before that, there was there was a, a murder that had happened in Paso Robles, uh, another attempted murder that one of my friends went, got locked up for, uh, so there was some, some other stuff going on, um, you know, and I, I just, I, at that point, you know, I had just moved to Salinas to wait to get off probation and go back. At that point, I didn't even get my probation paper, walking papers yet. My grandfather pleaded with me. He's like, just wait till you get your paperwork. Just wait till you get paperwork. Don't leave. And I was like, no, nah, I'm gone. Grandpa. I can't I can't stay here. Because I felt like God was talking to me. I was like, man, what the heck is going on, man? This is crazy. I opened this book. to talking to me. I go to church. Now this guy's talking to me like he got. I, I got to get out of here, you know? And uh, I remember I did one I did one last thing, you know, so so lost in our stuff. My my One of my homeboys had got cracked for selling dope. And that was the main person that I used to get stuff from. And so I had to find another connect. So I found another connect before I left in Salinas. And uh, and I and I went and got all whatever I got, you know, and had it at my grandfather's house, you know. And, and, it's, and it's a shame, too. You know, I got the, I got a gun and I got drugs in my, my grandfather's house, the pastor's house. And I'm thinking, man, I got this stuff. I got to put it in the trunk of my grandfather's car. And he's going to take me to the Amtrak. <laughs> so I get back over there. I'm like, I don't know where he pulls over, man. My grandfather, 
my grandfather gonna be on the front page, pastor with pastor with all these drugs and a gun, you know. Uh, so I I ended up putting it in the car and we went. My grandfather he kept pleading with me not to leave, just tell me to stay. I didn't stay. I left. I went back, I'm staying at my homeboys in their garage again. Uh, I got a job. Within a couple of weeks, I got into it with some people, you know. Um, and I, I went to go get even. They weren't there, and uh, ended up. I had like I told you, I got kicked out of all the school districts. So they had summer school. I was still there. Was still a part of me trying to get my high school diploma or GD. So I was like, man, I'm just gonna roll in summer school and try to try to knock some of this stuff out. And worst case scenario, I'll go. There's this camp in San Luis Obispo. It's called Grizzly. You can go there for like six months and you can get your GED, right? Because no matter what I had in my mind, I said, even if I sell these drugs or I get money, I need to start a business. So I need to get this GD so I could take some college courses and I could figure all this stuff out because I need to run a legit business somehow, uh, flip all this this money. And uh, I went to school, got into it with somebody else right out in the middle of the street, pulled this guy out of his truck, beat him up pretty good. Uh, you know, there's big old maybe two of my homeboys with me, uh, all him and a truckload. Ended up, ended up, whatever happened, happened, all the cars screaming and yelling and honking and all that stuff. And uh, we peeled out, you know, everybody already called the police. So we peeled out thinking nothing. And next thing you know, I get pulled over. They asked me what happened, you know, nothing, nothing happened. Shoot, what are you talking about? You know, I don't have nothing on me. I think I might've had a scratch that I didn't know I had on my face somewhere. And uh, I just kept saying nothing, you know, and, uh, and, they, and they ended up pulling that person over down the street, him and his crew. And he told them that we fought. <laughs> Right, and I'm on juvenile probation still. I'm supposed to be getting off. And uh, I'm like, damn, they're gonna take me to juvenile hall. Uh, they ended up they ended up saying, you know what, your probation officer said for you to call him. He didn't know you were back in town and they, they let it go. You know, they let it go as a mutual combat. The other guy just said, we just got into a fight and that was it. Uh, so he called me, he's like, I don't know what you're doing. Why are you even back? And I was like, well, I'm living right here at my friend's house in the garage. I'm working, you know, I put up you know, all the front that I need to put up. And uh, he said, all right, you know, if they would have took me in that day, you know, maybe things would have been different. I don't know. Uh, you know, you, you never know. Uh, within within the next week or two, my homeboy and me were going out. You know, I was supposed to be at work Friday night. You know, I, I was working a graveyard shift. or well, not graveyard shift from like, I think it was like 2 to 11 or something like that. I wasn't 18 yet. So I couldn't work the, all the way into the night or something. I don't remember what the exact rules were. And uh, I was getting into it at work because I ran into some dudes that I didn't get along with from another neighborhood. And they were trying to get me at work. So I told my homeboys, hey, just come pick me up after work, man. Uh, so so I, we can get busy with these guys. They don't want to fight one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and so I would be ready every time. If I didn't have a ride. I have a bike. I mean, I have whatever I can have on me uh, riding home to my homeboy's house. And, I, you know, going back and forth with all that stuff, uh, going back and forth. The Mid-State Fair is about to come happen. That happens every year, like the end of July, beginning of August, and past Robles. We always end up going there, partying, fighting, everything, you know. Sometimes people get stabbed, things happen. Uh, so that was coming up. And, um, and um, you know, my, my homeboy's cousin comes from Arizona. And, uh, you know, I'm looking out for him. And it's the homie's cousin. So, all right, I'm selling dope. Dude don't got nothing. I'm going to plug him in, you know. Maybe he can, he can help out. We get stuff going. You know, who knows what we can we can do. He can get on his feet, and we can do some things while well, I'm working a full-time job, too. Uh, you know, we went out one night. Like I said, I was supposed to be at work. I called in sick. I had my my appendix was going to bust. I ended up, ended up being in the hospital that day. For whatever reason, they didn't want to operate. They let, released me. And uh, I probably could have went back to work, but I said, no, nah, I'm not going to go to work. I'm just going to hang out with the homies, you know, and party and whatnot. So we're waiting for uh, waiting for some pages. We had a cell phone, the little old school pages, you know. And uh, we ended up taking a walk through the Paso Robles High School, waiting for some phone calls. And we ended up running across some people that we don't even know, you know. And that situation turned bad real quick. My, my homeboy got stabbed four times. Uh and uh, somebody else got, ended up getting murdered, you know? Um, I saved my homeboy's life. I stayed at the scene with my homeboy, uh, Weddle, uh, and I just held his wounds. I had my cell phone. I ended up calling 911 to get a paramedics, you know, my mind. 
was like, I need to get out of here. You know, even though I didn't do nothing, I need to get out of here because, because they're going to, I'm going to get locked up. You know, they're going to, everything's going to fall on me. You know, uh, I don't really know. The guy who got murdered was on the other side of your guys' side. On the other side. So my homeboy got stabbed four times first uh, behind the gym in Paso Robles High School uh, while we were walking through, you know, and, uh, and he was telling, he was on the ground screaming, uh, holding the guy's leg, you know, who he thought stabbed him and saying, he stabbed me, he stabbed me, he stabbed me, you know, that guy ended up breaking free and running. Uh, I went after him, you know, thinking that he, that he, uh, stabbed my friend and, you know, I went to go get even, you know, I went to go, to go beat him up, do whatever I could. I didn't have no knife on me. Uh, you know, so I was being very cautious when I caught up to him and he turned around to start fighting with me. Um, you know, I just told him, why you stab my homie? Why you stab my homie? And and we started getting busy. And I'm being cautious, you know, jumping back, making sure that he don't stick me, you know? Uh, next thing I know, he's leaking everywhere, you know? And uh, I knew I had not did that, you know? And I didn't see who did that. So I was like, man, I got to get out of here. You know, I, I had there had been numerous situations or quite a few situations before that where I had to watch people get caught up uh, for murders and stuff. And I would always tell myself that would never be me. I'm too, I'm too quick on my toes. I'll never get caught like that, right? Uh, and if if I if I was gonna do it, I'm gonna do it right, and I ain't gonna get caught, you know. And so I knew I didn't do that, so I peeled out. And then while I'm in the process of peeling out, I see my homeboy on the ground in a puddle of blood, and I was like, man, I can't leave him. So I stayed with him. I ended up staying with him, like I said. Uh, you know, I came up with a plan in my head real quick. I was like, I'm gonna call my other homeboy, tell him to come pick us up. I'm going to hold all his wounds. We're going to drop him off at the emergency room so they can save his life. And then I'm going to peel out. Nobody even know I'm there, you know? So I don't. my name don't even got to get brought up. Uh, that didn't happen. My homeboy's like, man, fool, call, call the paramedics, fool. He's going to die. I'm like, damn, that's what I didn't want to do. You know, I don't want to call 911. So I ended up calling Ended up calling 911. And they came. They came. They found me at the scene holding him, all his wounds. Uh they ended up saving his life. I saved his life. They said if I wasn't there, he would he would have been dead. You still there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blacked out right there. Somebody tried to call. Sorry. Uh, anyways, uh, so the other guy, his friend, had got him. He had three friends with him. I don't know where they went. They had all disappeared uh, in the in the beginning of the fighting. You know, uh, I think once my homeboy got stabbed, everybody kind of disappeared. I don't know where they were at. Didn't see them again. Uh, and only one of them at the end, he was trying to get his friend into to the car to try to take him, you know. And uh, and from what I was told, they only made it up to the front of the school, uh, and, and he passed away. So I'm, I'm getting I'm getting charged with murder, gang enhancements, assault with deadly weapons, multiple multiple assaults with deadly weapons, all kinds of stuff. Uh, how did they catch the, you, bro? I mean, how did they how did they figure you? Well, they they that was arrested at the scene, so. So they had witnesses and stuff? Um, yeah, so they had one of the guys, well, I found out later, uh, they had two witnesses. Uh, one guy, like I said, I think they both didn't see nothing, just whatever was going on in the beginning, you know? Uh, they said certain things. So anyways, I'm in, I'm in the police station. I don't know what time it is, midnight, one or two in the morning. I don't really remember what time it was. I'm sitting in there, you know, and I remember they sat me in a uh, uh, holding tank, right? I, have, I was covered in blood, you know? They came and they went and did their swabs, all all the swabs, got all the blood off me for DNA or whatever they, whatever they were doing, see whose blood was whose. Uh, and I'm sitting there covered in blood, and uh, they bring they bring in uh, they bring in my homeboy's cousin, right? I don't I don't really I don't even I think he went back to the neighborhood, from what I was told, you know, and I don't I don't know all the details of that. He was telling everybody certain things that happened, you know, so a lot of mothers and aunts and everybody kind of. Uh, said his name and I and from my understanding uh, he had dropped his ID or something where the other guy had got stabbed and they had a shoe print or something I don't I don't really know all the details of that but um, they bring him in and I can hear him he can't see me I'm in the holding tank you know and he can't see me and and I hear him come in and he tells him that I did everything and I'm thinking in my head, what the hell this freaking i don't even know who stabbed the guy right now at this point you know all i know is my homeboy got stabbed four times i'm thinking the other guy stabbed him and i'm like man in my head i'm like this fool did it this fool did it 
and he's throwing me under the bus, man. That's crazy. So I don't say nothing. I just straight quiet. I'm listening to every, whatever he says to them, right? This ain't this ain't on no paperwork. This is in the police station, you know, and uh, and I and I'm, my whole world is just like, what the heck, you know? Uh, next next thing next thing I know, they they put they put me in this other room with a chaplain. I don't even know what a chaplain is. No clue what a chaplain is. This guy sitting across from me, just looking at me, looking at me, kind of funny, you know, like just just like disgust, you know, like you're a scum of the earth type look to, towards me. And I'm like, who are you? And he's like, I'm a chaplain. And I was like, well, what the heck's a chaplain? And he's like, well, I'm here when somebody somebody dies. And at that moment, you know, I don't know, I don't know that my homeboy Weddle is alive or dead, you know. In the front of the police station at that time. You could hear people come in the front of the police station while I'm sitting in there, and I hear uh, a scream, you know, a horrific scream, and it was the mother of the other guy. She was screaming because they just told her that her son had got had, had passed away, you know. And uh, I had got so cold blooded in my heart that I didn't really care, you know. And that's and that's sad to say all that, you know. Today I care, but the only thing that went in my head. I know that wasn't my homeboy's mom. So he might still be alive. That's the only thing that went in my head, you know? And then I'll, and then thinking, damn, I'm in some stuff, you know? Like, all right, cool. And then it, from when I heard that guy come in and say certain things, I was like, all right, cool. We'll see what happens, you know? Uh, later on that night or early morning, so that day, that was July 23rd, 1999. Uh, the next day, the 24th. So I don't know if it was three in the morning or whatnot. They put us in the back of a cop car together. Right. And I may be naive. I don't know all the whole system, but I was, I was at least smart enough to know, like, like they, they probably put us back here for a reason. Right. They're probably recording us trying to see what we say to each other and whatnot. Right. And I, since I already heard him say certain things to them, I'm like, all right, cool. I'm going to make this full tell on himself, uh, you know, and then I'm going to be out of here, you know? Uh, so they put us in the back of the cop car. They're going to take him to the county and me to the juvenile hall. So I tell him, you know, well, like, what's up, man? What happened? You know, and he tells me the whole the whole rundown of what whatever he happened, you know, whatever he says happened. And and I'm like, cool. Shoot. I'm thinking in my head, you know, I gave him advice. I told him, look, man, there's some homies that got life sentences. Uh, you know, they took everybody down with them. Like, do what you need to do to let us let us cut us loose. Don't don't tie us up in this, man, because, uh, you know, nobody knew whatever was going on or whatever you decided to do. You know what I mean? You know, and I was like, you just try to make the best deal, the best deal you probably could get. If you can't get nothing better, at least 15 in life or lesser, you know, but cut us loose, man. And so we had that conversation. He gave me his word that he was going to do that. And this, this and that. He went to the county jail. I went to juvenile hall and we got a ring for all the stuff. Uh, my friend came like days later to the juvenile hall, you know, all stapled up from all the stab wounds. They said if he would have went a little bit further like that, uh, he would have been paralyzed. Uh, and if he would have lost any more blood, he would have dead. He would have been dead. So then then goes fighting the case, you know, fighting the case. Here we go. Now I got murder. Now I got gang enhancements. Now I find out that one of the guys at the scene saying he seen me with a knife, which wasn't true. Then then he's saying he seen me hold the other guy down. Uh, well, the other guy stabbed him. Then he said he seen me stab him. So many different versions of things that they said happened that did not happen, you know. Uh, and so I, man, I've, you feel like everything's against you. The whole world's against you. Everybody kind of just disappears, you know. I knew I had a little bit of money from hustling. It wasn't a lot. I don't know how much it was, maybe 4000 or something or six grand. I don't remember what it was. But I remember, you know, they gave me that first call from the juvenile hall. And I hadn't talked to my dad since he kicked me out when I was 14, maybe once or twice. And I told him, I was like, you know, I need some help. They got me in here for murder. And he's like, he cussed me out, told me a bunch of stuff. And then, you know, the juvenile hall guards were listening to my dad cuss me out and tell me all this crazy stuff. And he's like, don't say nothing. I'm going to get you an attorney. I'm like, all right, cool. And I told him, I told him where I had my, my money at. You know, I was like, just go over here and tell, tell my homeboy to give you that money. Uh, I had it in like a little safe thing. And he's like, all right. So he went and got that money and got me an attorney out of Santa Maria, uh, Dario Berjarano. And uh, we started going to court. We went through all the fitness hearings. You know, the other guy was an adult. My homeboy, Weddle, was a juvenile. And I was still a juvenile. They couldn't put our faces in none of the papers or nothing like that, you know, as far as the juveniles. 
and uh, we went to court. We went to all their fitness hearings. They brought that person who said he seen me stab the guy or he said he seen me hold him down, all the different stories he said. And they brought him into the courtroom and they told him to point me out. He didn't point me out. He pointed out my homeboy Weddle that had got stabbed and was freaking 50 or 100 yards. You there? Sorry about that. Anyways, he didn't point me out. He pointed out the other dude. The DA was so confident. The DA's name was Matthew Kraut. He was so confident. Uh, and, uh, you know, he started backpedaling in, in court, started saying, oh, well, you're not sure it was dark that night and started trying to get him to, you know, say it was me somehow. I don't know. So I'm like, cool. Sh there it goes. Some of the truth coming out, you know, I'm, I'm ain't nothing. I'm going to get out of this. You know, I'm going to I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prison or all these years. You know, they're tripping. And, uh, you know, during that time in the beginning, I remember they put me in the holding tank uh, till I gave them a drug test, you know, because they wanted to give us a drug test. And I had learned from some OG how to how to flood my system, you know, because that night I had, I had been smoking some chronic and drinking a little bit, you know, and I didn't even want that to be used against me or nothing. So I, I flooded my system. Uh, and then I finally gave them uh, what they wanted, like a day, a day later or whatnot. You know, I worked it however I could work it. Uh, and I peed, I peed clean, so that my system peed clean. And then there was the, there was a chief probation officer. His name was John Lum. Good dude, man. He believed in, in youngsters and trying to give people a second chance and help them out. He was coming by every day, and I remember he came by with this little tiny Bible, this little tiny Gideon pocket Bible, right? And he kept, and I was like, Nah, man, I'm not. I don't want that. I'm cool. He kept walking by, and uh, you know, I, I had felt like I was Jonah, kind of. I felt like I was in the belly of the well and I was running from God and I couldn't run no more. God put me in a, uh, a cell with four corners and there was nowhere to run no more. Right. And I started feeling like God saying, are you ready now? I got your attention. You know, there was one thing I didn't tell you when I was in Hawaii uh, with my mother. Right. Uh, there was this guy, his name was Larry Cordova. He was from San Jose or that area. But he was out there and he kept saying he was a prophet from God and all this stuff. You know, I, I don't know. But as a kid, you know, you're like, whatever. Uh, but he told me, I remember him telling me, like, if you don't get right with God, by the time you're 18, you're going to be in prison for a really long time. And God wants me to tell you that. And I would tell him, I'll cuss him out and tell him all this stuff. Like, you crazy, man. Now all that's coming back to my head while I'm sitting in this cell in juvenile hall. I'm like, man, that's crazy. Could this be real? You know, and then I was having, I had this experience before I, before I uh, went in at my grandfather's house, you know, and I had, I didn't tell nobody about any of this God stuff, you know, my, uh, the only people I told was my girlfriend at that time and her, and her uh, homegirl, Rosie uh, Garcia, you know, and they were tripping out on me. They're like, man, maybe God got something for you. You know, they're, they were tripping out. And, and, and before I got arrested that month, my homeboy Hugo, we were smoking weed and we were in his garage and he tells me out of nowhere, he said, you and Weddle are going to end up getting life. God told me to tell you guys that. And I'm like, what the hell? Don't ever say nothing like that. What's wrong with you, man? You don't be talking like that. You're cursing me. And I told him that stuff at that time. All this stuff's coming back to my memory, sitting in that cell in juvenile hall, you know? And uh, I was like, wow, that's crazy. Next time that chief of probation, John Lum, come by with that little Gideon Bible, I'm like, all right, man, shoot it to me. And my first thing I read was a proverb. And it basically said that I ain't listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> your prayers right i think it's about uh, wisdom i'm talking about something else but that was the first thing i read like you were rebellious and i ain't gonna listen to what you gotta say you know uh i, I gotta know? ask a dumb question before you go yeah. on it is dumb yeah. only only having been in been in jail myself what color was that gideon what color was what the, oh i don't remember i think it was a little brown little brown uh you know i don't know what this like a snakeskin brown or something i don't know what you call it Okay, because I, I there was a lot of orange ones, white ones, green ones, and brown ones. So, yeah, yeah. whatever it was. Go ahead, bro. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was a little pocket one. And so yeah. I, I just started my – so and then my little brother's already in the juvenile hall. You know, he was in CPS and foster care and all that. He ended up beating somebody up in his group home. So he's in there the same time as me. He's getting in into it with other dudes in the other unit. I can hear them, you know. They're coming to get me as the bigger brother. Come talk to your brother, man. You know, so I'm, I'm doing mediation up in there <laughs> to my brother and other people. And and, uh, and it's, it's just going crazy, you know, and I'm facing this life sentence now. Uh, you know, I go to court. I get arraigned. I get arraigned on my 18th birthday. 
because I was going to turn 18 soon, get a ring for the 18th birthday. You know, like I said, I hadn't been in trouble or I hadn't got caught for anything for over a year or around that time. And the judge had knew me. So he was like, Mr. Contreras, I hope these things are not true. I haven't seen you in my courtroom for over a year, you know, and all this stuff. So I got a ring for the murder, the gang enhancements and every, everything else. I mean, they, they just stack everything they can on there, right? So there's all kinds of assaults and all kinds of stuff that weren't even true, too. Uh, and I remember coming back to juvenile hall that night. They had me and my homeboy separated, you know, the one that got stabbed Weddle. Uh, he was on, I was on West Unit and he was on Central or East. And so one of the guards came to me at night after I got arraigned and he's like, hey, your homeboy Weddle wants you to go to church. So I'm like, all right, cool. You know, yeah, hopefully they're going to let us go together so we can, we can go talk. Uh, so I go to church. Weddle's not there because we got a non-association clause, right? They won't let us be together. But I'm in there, and there's this group of men that call Many Broken Vessels. They're like Victory Outreach, right? But they're not Victory Outreach. Some, some old, OG Southsider from L.A., uh, uh, this dude that was a crib from Santana Block. And these guys are OG, you know, and this other youngster from Northwest out of Santa Maria. He was probably like 25 years old, right? And they come in. And so I'm like, all right, cool. I just sit right here. There's a guy sitting next to me. He's in there. I know him. Uh, his brother had beat up one of my homeboys, and we always said that, like, when we see them, it's on site, you know? So he's sitting next to me, and he's in there for shooting at one of my homeboys, at, at, which I didn't know yet, right? Uh, or shooting at somewhere where he thought he was at. And so we're sitting in there. They give their message. This youngster is 25 years old out of Santa Maria. He shares his whole story about selling drugs and doing all this stuff and how his mom prayed for him and uh, that he wouldn't get caught up, and he ends up in jail. And uh, and he ended up becoming Christian, man. And I was just tripping out on it. You know, this 25-year-old dude, you know, I'm like, man, what the heck? Things never made sense like they made sense that night, you know? You tell me all this stuff about God. I'm like, no, nah, I don't want to hear none of that. Forget that. Miss me with all that. Or if it's real, I'll wait until right before my dying, my dying breath, and I'll say that prayer so I get my pass into heaven, you know, trying to work the system. Uh but I never, never cared for none of that. I mean, I would tell people crazy stuff. They would tell me stuff about God. Like, man, I worship Satan. What's up? You know, don't give me those tracks. Show them tracks in your chest. You know, people would trip out on me. Like, why are you like that? Like, I just didn't want to hear none of that stuff. You know, and like I said, when I was with my family, I would be out of respect. I would go there and keep my mouth shut. Uh, but that's how I was, you know. And so listening to this kid, you know, from this neighborhood. And I'm like, man, that dude's just like me. I ain't never seen nobody. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm younger. He's 25 years old, but he's still kind of a youngster, too. You know, he's just like me. And uh, I didn't want to change, man. I didn't want to become a Christian. I didn't want to do none of that stuff. I just wanted to get out and go back to doing my thing because I thought I had everything figured out. You know, I thought I had a game plan, you know, and my game plan was to sell drugs until I came up and flip that into legal money, you know. Um, but that night something just clicked and made sense and they asked you to say the sinner's prayer so i said i was like you know what god i don't know what's gonna happen right now man i'm about to spend the rest of my life in prison for something i didn't do only you know what really happened that night you know you know i didn't stab that guy you know i didn't hold that guy down to be stabbed and i don't even want to serve you but you know what if you can change my circumstances and you can change me because you got to change me i cannot change me you know I still want to do evil things, man. I still want to hurt some people. I want to kill some people. I want to I want to go get high. I want to go have sex with all the women I can. I want to do all the crazy things that that was that I'd like to do. You know, I still want to do those things, but I need you to change me. If this if, if this is real, I need you to change me. And so I said a prayer that night, man. And uh and something happened. I don't I don't, I don't know how to explain all that stuff, but little by little things started happening. The guy next to me that was there for shooting my shooting at my friend, uh he said that prayer too. So I went that night thinking I'm going to go see my homeboy, Weddle. Ended up getting saved. Right. And all the times I was in juvenile hall and juvenile service center, JSC in San Luis Obispo, before that, you know, they have like a, a system, like a point system where you go to bed a certain time. <laughs> if, if you don't behave and you get in trouble, I was always getting in trouble, not big trouble, but just enough where I wasn't, where I wasn't able to stay up. You know, it got the guards were noticing like there were some changes in me. They were about to put a documentary on me. In the juvenile hall, uh, you know, I started doing good. Uh, you know, it wasn't it wasn't easy. Things didn't change overnight. I had a bad, foul mouth. Everything was a bad word out of my mouth. You know, uh, I mean, I got to the point where 
I'm writing letters and they have to read all my mail because of my case. Uh, they're coming to me like, look, man, stop cussing in your letters. I'm not going to send out your letters no more. <laughs> if you stop cussing in your letters, I'll let you send out two letters a night instead of one. You know, I'll do that indigent mail that they do. And, you know, little by little, every Wednesday night, many broken vessels. I was there faithfully, started listening to everything they got to say, started uh, forming a little group of us guys in there that were in there for serious offenses, uh, praying together, you know, uh, looking out for some some dudes that came in there and never been locked up before, don't know nothing about the streets, maybe just hanging out with somebody and everybody tried to victimize them, you know. Ended up making friends with some of those people and their families, you know, just, just for looking out for them and helping them out. Uh, and the case kept going, you know. Uh, my homeboy's cousin I was in adult court. He went through his whole process. He got uh, 29 years to life. Uh, I'm up next. I get tried. I get finally get go through all the fitness hearings. Tried as an adult. I'm going up to the court next to go for my life sentence. Uh, and then my homeboys, uh, my homeboy, he stays in there because he basically he's a victim, you know. So they gave him like two or three years in ROP. So he did time in juvenile hall and then he had to go to ROP, rites of passage out in Nevada. I think it's in Nevada or somewhere out there. It's like a boy's home out there. And then he got out. Um, and I, I went to, I was starting going to my trial, man. You know, starting to set things up, going to my whatever other things, get charges dropped. I got everything dropped. The only thing that lacked standard was the first degree murder and the gang enhancement. Uh, you know, I ended up firing my attorney. I got another attorney from out of Salinas, Thomas Worthington. Uh, and we kept fighting. And then on my day that I was supposed to pay my jury, I was not taking no deal. I was like, nah, man, I didn't do nothing. I shouldn't have to go to prison for the rest of my life. You know what I mean? And my attorney would tell me, man, dude, like you're young, you have a little bit of a record already. And uh, they go, they, they, there's a possibility that you can get a life sentence. And if you get a life sentence, Gray Davis, who was the governor at that time, you ain't going to go home. They say you're going to go home in a pine box and they're going to bring up everything in a micro, my, you know, uh, magnifying glass on your life, you know, and they're going to make you look bad. And they were already making me look bad, you know, everything that they, they could find uh, where they were throwing at me. There was a lot of dirty stuff that happened during my court hearing. So, so I remembered the, they put us back in the back of the cop car. So I told, I told my attorney, well, subpoena that tape. Cause I know they had to be recording us, man. They don't put us back there for no reason. Subpoenaed it. They said they couldn't hear nothing. It was all static. I was like, man, these people are dirty. I got the juvenile probation officer. They gave me a juvenile probation officer, like an intake officer inside the juvenile hall. Her name was Lenore Gallagher. I don't know what's up with that lady, but she wanted me to spend the rest of my life in prison. And she was there every day telling me I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prison. Every day coming to me and telling me that. Uh, it got so bad that I had to tell my attorney, you don't let that lady come see me no more. If she comes see me, she needs to come with an officer or somebody to speak to me. Uh, I'm in the courtroom. They had a, another probation officer come in there. And I don't, to this day, I don't know what people got out of this, but there was a lot of bad stuff that happened in my case. Her name was Lori Camp. She was a juvenile probation officer. She went into the courtroom and said that me and my homeboy Weddle were high-fiving that we were getting away with murder and the gang stuff. And there was no way we could be high-fiving. We're all in shackles, belly chains and everything, you know? And I didn't even kill the dude. So I'm like, what the heck is this lady talking about? She went in the courtroom and testified to that. And I was like, wow, man, these people are crazy man this is insane and there, there's just so much stuff i was i had a lot of anger you know i was still dealing with i'm trying to change my life now you know uh, people are like man that's fake how can you become christian you been here for murder blah 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 you know i get i got fine fit as an adult that day when i got fit as an adult they took me to the county jail to, to the hell to the whole 100 block in san Luis Obispo county uh so i sat in there i'm seeing all the all the dudes that i was in juvenile hall with their dads and uncles up in there you know, in the hole with me. I'm sitting in the hole for a few months. I'm trying to, I, at that time, I had already fired my attorney. I got the new one out of Salinas. I was trying to get back to the juvenile court so I could go to YA if worst case scenario, you know. Uh, and so he got me back into the juvenile hall, at least so I could go to school, try to get my high school diploma or something because they had, they were doing school in juvenile. You know, just one thing after another, you know, things, things were going on, so a lot of dirty stuff. And I, I still had a lot of anger, but I was learning things from Calvary Chapel was coming in every Sunday. I would go with them, many broken vessel guys every Wednesday. And uh, the day I was supposed to pick my jury, the day I was supposed to pick my jury, uh, or I should go back to this. This lady came in, her name was Jean Cook. Old white lady, 
beautiful lady, man. You know, uh, you know, good, good person. What I mean by that, right? She came in. I don't even know her. I'm on the unit, and she tells me. She tells me I'm gonna. Uh, she tells me hi. I don't say hi to her because I don't even know her. I'm like, who are you? Freaking, I don't know you. You know. <laughs> and then she comes and tells me. She says, "You want to be hard all your life? You want to be like this?" And I don't know. I don't remember all the exact words she said to me, but it. I was on the unit by myself, breaking, uh, setting up the the lunch tables. You know, they usually have like two, two kids setting up the lunch tables. So I'm setting them up, and whatever she told me just just hit me, struck me, struck me right in my heart, man. And I, and I started crying, you know. And I was holding these tears in while when she's talking to me. I wasn't letting nobody see him. I was just holding them in. I'm setting up the tables, and she's like, "I'm gonna come visit you on Friday. Is that all right with you?" And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah," you know. And uh, I was like, "All right, cool." She came visit me. She started coming visit me every week. She started reading the Bible with me and explaining things to me in the Bible. She, she, uh, you know, I had never heard of the Serenity Prayer, A A N A, really none of that stuff, right? So she's like doing this stuff with me, the twelve steps, right? And not that I'm an alcoholic or a drug addict or nothing, but she's just walking this stuff through me. And we do a self inventory of, of basically like all my, all my faults, all my sins, all this stuff. I write everything down. I'm doing this. This lady's like shocked that I'm doing all this stuff with her. She's like, nobody does these things. You know, you're a kid. Like, and I, I was being honest and it was so honest that I wrote a lot of stuff down that I shouldn't have wrote down. And, uh, and she had a good relationship with the juvenile hall, ju juvenile guards. And they let me shred all that stuff. Right. Uh, so she was beginning to work with me. This other older lady, Ruth Smith, she would come in and do Bible studies and explain things. So she, they were coming to visit us. Uh, and so I started to make some understandings. They read this scripture to me, Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future, right? And there's a lot more to that right there. But it basically says that God, when you seek him with all your heart, he's going to bring you back from your captivity. And for some reason, whatever, when she read that, it leaped off the pages to me. Like, I got hope. Right now, it seems like I got no hope that I'm about to do the rest of my life in prison. I'm never going to get out of here. But I got hope now. And she could see it, you know. Uh, I didn't know it then, but she was writing a journal on everybody that she was seeing in the juvenile hall. And so this other lady, Jean Cook, would go to all my court hearings now, praying with me, talking to me. Uh, so I'm, I'm there getting tried as an adult in the adult courtroom now. Uh, it's my day to pick my jury. They come out, and my attorney tells me they offer you a deal. They want to give you voluntary mass slaughter and gang enhancement. And they want to give the sentencing open from four years. So mid, uh, low term, mid term and high term. The max you get is, uh, what is it? Uh, three years, three years, six and 11. I think it was at that time. And then the gang enhancement at that time was three years max, right? So you can get either one, two or three. Uh, I had just, I fell under the old law that year. They changed prop 21, uh, and then you could get like six, ten, or a life sentence off the gang enhancement. So I still fell under the old law. And I told him, I'm not taking no deal. Hell no. For what? Why am I gonna take a deal? I didn't kill him, you know? I didn't kill him. I know I know I was there, stuff, certain things happened or whatever, but I didn't kill the dude. Why should I go to spend the rest of my life in prison? Why should I do any time? And I was very adamant about that. My attorney told me, he's like, Look, man, if you catch this life sentence, you're not gonna get out. I want you to go back to the juvenile hall and I want you to think about this. We're going to tell the judge, we're going to give you two two weeks. He's off. If we take this deal, you can put on a sentencing hearing of all the things that you've done since you were in juvenile hall, uh, the case factors, the mitigating factors, and you might have a shot of getting the lower sentence. So I was like, all right, I'll, I'll wait two weeks. I'll think about it. And they sent everybody to me in two weeks. I mean, I, I was seeing a counselor regularly, therapist or psychiatrist in there to make sure I was all right. Um, my grandma came visit me. My grandma just recently passed uh, a few weeks back, uh, but she came visit me who I was living with, and she, she basically cussed me out in the visiting room. Like, you better not get no life sentence, you know. And I'm like, Grams, like I'm gonna do the life sentence, not you, right? But she would, she would do it too, because they're gonna be visiting me or whatever happens, you know. Right, 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 right. But at that time, I'm like, I'm not gonna take a deal, Grams. Why am I gonna take a deal? I'm not gonna take a life sentence. I'm not gonna even take 20, uh, 10, 14 years or whatever that is, four years. Why? Uh, they sent everybody to me. I mean, everybody was like, you won't take the deal, man. Don't don't get a life sentence. You know, I got, at this point, there was a murder that happened in 1998. 
a group of guys from two, two different segments, maybe a couple of different segments, had killed my friend's cousin, Dreamer. And one of those dudes, one of those guys had already got a life sentence. He got, like five of them got life sentences. But one of those guys, he was in foster care. And uh, he, he was the main person who uh, supposedly stabbed uh, Dreamer and killed him. He wrote a letter to the juvenile hall, to somebody in the juvenile hall, one of the guards or somebody, and said to give the letter to me, right? And we're enemies. There's two different groups right here, right? His name's David Ray. He wrote a letter and basically told him, he's like, look, I don't want to see no, basically no, no one go what I, go through what I'm going through, man. Like, take a deal, bro. Like, they offered, he, he told me in the letter that they offered all of them 11 years and they ended up getting 15 in life because they didn't take the deal. They would all been out. He dropped he me a letter, an enemy, sending me a letter from my well-being, right? I don't, I don't know him personally, but I know he's from the other side and, we, and, we, and we're not getting along. This dude went out of his way and sent me a letter. Uh, another person, this lady came in. Her name was Cynthia. Uh, I don't know what her, her new last name is because she got married again, but her, her last name was Anderson at the time. Her husband was in prison. She would come into the juvenile hall with her daughter and share how her husband had a life sentence and the daughter sharing how that affected her as a kid, you know? And I remember all the kids in there were just pounding around, messing around, and I, I made everybody shut up. I was like, everybody, you know? And there, she was tripping out. I got all the kids in this, just shut up. I was like, look, check this out. I know they don't understand all this stuff, but I'm about to get a life sentence. So uh, if you can at least do me a favor and just pray for me, you know? And from that interaction, she came visit me. She came visit me and she started talking with her husband in prison and he started talking to me. We had similar, a similar case. And she, so she started giving me advice from him and he's telling me the same thing. They offered him a deal. Now he's doing 25 or 26 to life. You know, and they were like, it doesn't matter if it's not fair, bro. This is just how things go. Like, you got to take, you got to take, you know, what you can. And hopefully you don't get caught up in, inside. So, I mean, I'm sitting there for two weeks thinking about it. They do a, a probation report. Probation report pretty much comes back in my favor. Says that they should not send me to prison. That uh, that uh, they don't have enough evidence saying that I they did whatever they, that I did whatever they accused me of. The person that they said is testifying against me uh, has changed the story multiple times, whatever. Uh, and, you know, they did a panel uh, for this probation report. A couple of people basically said that they should send me up. The rest of them said that they shouldn't send me up, that they should they should give me the least amount of time. So I'm feeling confident. All right, I'm going to go to this hearing. If I take this deal, I got a good probation officer report for sentencing recommendation. I got all this stuff that I've done since I've been locked up. I go to court and I tell them. I finally tell them, you know, they, my mom and my dad, they put me in the back room with them, the jury room, by myself to talk to them. You know, they've been divorced, fighting for years. They're in here talking to me about taking this deal. So I break it down. I say, all right, man, I don't agree. I don't want to take this deal, but I'm going to take the deal. So I take the deal. I go back in there. They put me for sentencing. Sentencing comes. They say all the stuff. The DA blasts the, the probation department, John Lum. I think they were, I don't know, I think they were going to have him arrested or something. I don't know. Uh, but they didn't, they did not like that guy. That guy was trying to help out all the youngsters, man. I mean, as far as, you know, creating programs, helping people. Uh, and they didn't like that. Uh, so they recommended that I don't go to prison and they gave me probation or something. And the DA basically said that they got too attached to me and all this stuff. And they ended up giving me 14 years. My attorney had told me that him and the DA had talked and the judge in the back room. And that worst case scenario, I was going to get eight years. That's what they told me. And I told my attorney, you know, I was I'm young. I should have made sure they put it in paper. Uh, I said, well, why don't you go have them write it down? And he's like, no. My attorney was being all scary. He was like, I don't want him to take the deal back away. And I was like, man. I was like, all right. Went to sentencing. Psh, 14 years. Boom. And I'm like, man, they went back on their word. They said in worst case scenario, over eight. I had a shot for three. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm angry, I'm frustrated. Um, uh, and the, and the judge, before he sends me, he tells me, Mr. Contreras, don't think your life is over. You'll still be a fairly young man when you get out at 30 years old from now. Right. He's said, oh, there was some recent guy who just got out. who was a boxer or something in the Olympics. I think he was talking about, uh, I don't know. I think it was that movie hurricane or something, but that guy was innocent. <laughs> it's like, wait, are you, are you telling me? 
that you're knowing you're sending me to prison for stabbing this person that I didn't stab. Is that what you're telling me that in my head? You know, I'm like, man, it's crazy. And uh, so I just sends me 14 years. I got up. The courtroom was packed. All my family, friends, homies, uh, the victim's family and friends. Um, you know, I get up in my shackles. They escort me to the back to go back to the, to the county. And I just basically say my goodbyes to my family in the courtroom. And I go back to the county, go back to the prison pod now and it's, and and wait for him to catch the chain, you know? So now you're on your way. You, you're you going back through the hallways. You got 14 years. Was this during the time of halftime or what was it? No. So uh, I got a strike, uh, got the gang enhancement. So that mean at that time, you got to do 85%, right? So uh, so 14 years with 85%, right? Wow. Uh, you're, so, like one of the, you're one of the youngins right there in the county jail, obviously, you know? Yeah, by that time, I'm already, I think I had already turned 19. I think I was already 19 now. So for 17, I spent juvenile hall, the county, I'm in there, I'm 19 years old. Wow, bro, yeah. C continue with the story, bro. That's cool. This is awesome. I mean, it's okay. not awesome uh, what you went through, but it's an awesome because I know the end. So well, let's keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so 19 years old. Going back to the county, waiting to catch the chain. Uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of a lot of other older dudes, OGs in in my tank. I mean, I think I'm in B deck in San Luis Obispo County Jail. Uh, one of my homeboys that got caught for selling dope, so he was in another another pod. I don't remember what pod it was, and uh, and you know, I was like, shoot, hopefully I catch the chain with my homie. You know what I mean? He said, no, somebody that I'm going with. I got some other dudes that are in the tank. They trying to school me down on prison and tell me all the stuff, the politics and all this kind of stuff. You know, I'm not really caring about none of that. Uh, it's a new experience for me, you know, a little bit scared at the same time, trying to figure everything out. Uh, I just know that no matter what, I had to protect myself and, uh, and you know, God, God had seen me through this far. I was a little bit mad. I felt angry at God right there because I was like, dude, I've got 14 years, God, what's up, you know? I didn't even stick to do like I, you know, and I had told myself if I get a life sentence or I get a bunch of time, the person that did it, that I found out who did it later, I'm going to get him when I get to the pen, you know? And so there's still this stuff that's kind of still, I'm God's still working on me with these things. Right. And I got some people coming to visit me and they're giving me books on forgiveness, mailing them to me or whatnot. And I'm like putting the book to the side, you know, I'm reading the Bible, but I'm putting those books to the side. Cause I'm like, I don't want to read that right now because I got to do something when I get to the pen, you know? And, uh, and I don't, I don't, I felt like I would, I'll be responsible that I had to forgive them or something. And so I would not read that stuff. Uh, but I was still trying to do right. You know, things, things don't happen overnight when you're used to living in a certain lifestyle, you got a lot of hurt and pain. You got things, you got to work on some things, man. It's a, it's a, it's a pro process, you know? And so there really was no church in the County, uh, catch the chain i ended up catching the chain with my homeboy uh so we ended up going to the same same block in wasco same same uh, reception center and then we ended up being cellies uh there which was pretty cool so at least i got to see one of my boys before i got all the way in to hit the main line and uh you know just went there just you know prison's prison man you see all the stuff the gang stuff the politics the dirty stuff that's going on there the drugs people getting stabbed whacked cut every well whatever you can think of riots all that kind of stuff so it's wasco um and then i get sent to i ended up getting sent to pleasant valley d yard uh so i missed level four by like i think it was like two points or something i think i think i have like 49 points uh, and they probably lowered my points because the good behavior that i had in juvenile hall and county i don't know but i probably should have been level four right off the bat uh, so I went to level three, Pleasant Valley DR. Before I went there, my celly uh, in uh, Pleasant Valley, I mean, uh, in Wasco, uh, this OG from Santa Ana, his name was Pelon. Real good dude. I forget his first name. Uh, I think his last name was Villa. But he was a real good dude, man. He, you know, he schooled me down, showed me what I need to do to survive in prison. You know, he had been in prison multiple times, uh, you know, told me how to take care of myself, you know, and conduct myself in the cell, conduct myself outside and on the yard. And, uh, you know, just, just, just not no gang stuff, you know, he showed me all that stuff too, but 
but how to take care of myself, you know, how to how to clean your cell, how to take a bird bath. You know, I ain't I ain't never took a bird bath before, right? We still had a shower in the county, juvenile hall. We had a shower. I'm like, man, bird bath. What what's? He's like, here, look, homito, let me show you how to, how you do this. You know how you make yourself a curtain, how you do this. Like, so he was cooling me down on all this stuff. Uh, so I was very appreciative to him, and he and he he gave me he gave me game, you know. Uh, so I ended up in Pleasant Valley D Yard. He had, he had already went there, so he was there. So you know, I got to Pleasant Valley D Yard. Uh, I ran into some other people that I knew uh, that were there. Uh, one of them, one of them for the case that happened in '98 that I told you guys that the other guy had wrote me a letter. Well, it was one of the other guys, uh, Droopy, named Sergio Ortiz, and uh, and dude took me under his wing too. You know, he's like, "Look, this is what you're gonna do," and I t and I told him, "Look, man, I'm not gonna be involved in none of this stuff." Like it was, it was kind of a, it was a little bit of a scare too, because I was like, dude, this dude's gonna think I'm a weenie. I'm not a weenie, but I found a different way already. I'm trying to live that way now, you know. And so he's like, look, don't tell any of these people this. He gave, he gave me the game and told me what to do, you know. You just run this and you do this. And so I let people know, like, look, man, I'm Christian. I ain't perfect, you know. Uh, there, I'm gonna have some mess ups, but I'm trying to do the right thing, man. I don't know how this all gonna work out. Like, I will defend myself if somebody runs up on me, you know. So, uh, and, and dude was good. He gave me some more game. Uh, you know, things worked out. I got to Bible study there, went to a bunch of stuff. I ended up getting locked up there pending investigation. So, uh, my continuation school principal, before I went to prison and all that stuff, he had kicked me out of continuation school, uh, cause he said that I looked at him in a threatening manner or something or whatnot. Well, it turns out his brother is working at the prison. And he's in the vocational welding. Uh, his name was Mr. Shakoya. I ended up back in small engine repair and vocation in Pleasant Valley D Yard. Uh, the dude probably says my name to his brother or something. Next thing I know, I'm getting locked up pending investigation. I got all these cops surrounding me. IGI asked me oh, what I what did I say what to this guy? What are the chances, huh? What are the chances? Yeah, what are the chances? I'm like, what? I don't even know what's going on, right? I just got all these cops around me now in this chow hall. Like, you know, like like they're going to jump me. I'm like, what's up? You know, like, they're like, what'd you say to this guy? I'm like, what guy? I don't even know what's going on yet, you know? And then they start telling me, well, the guy in there. I didn't say nothing, man. He asked me where I'm from. I told him. And then, uh, and that's it. You know, he says you threatened him. I was like, I didn't threaten him. I don't know. I don't know what he's talking about. They see, I know I'm in the program office. They're stripping me down naked, just freaking for no reason. I don't know what. Trying to ask me a bunch of questions about stuff that happened. Turns out those guards are from Paso Robles, and their their kids uh, are probably my age or something. They start asking me if I know their kids and all this. I'm like, I don't know your kids. I don't know nothing, man. Like, I don't even know why I'm here. Like, you guys are harassing me, basically. So they send me back to the cell. I stay in the cell pending investigation. Uh, for this threat to this free staff. They're telling me if I walk out the cell at any time and I see him, I'm not to look at him or go the other way. Uh, within a few weeks of being locked in the cell, they transferred me to to um, A Yard. Everybody who goes through A Yard or Pleasant Valley, at least they did when I was there. Uh, that was like the reception building before you got transferred to whatever yard they did. You have to classification. So I'm in A Yard chilling in, in the, that reception building. And uh, I had put in for a hardship. I had put in for a hardship to go to California men's colony just because to be close to my grandmother. Right. And, uh, basically that prison is no good. That prison, if you're still an active gang member, you can't be at that prison. Right. And if you're there, you need to get off in three days, 72 hours or, or 24 hours. Who depends what group you're from. Right. Uh, so I had put a hardship in there and they basically told me, yeah, right. You ain't never going there. You know, now all this stuff happens. They got me locked in a pending investigation. Now they're trying to find, send me somewhere as a threat and safety to the security of the institution or whatever that stuff was. Uh, next thing they call me on a yard and they say, Hey, we're going to honor your request to the hardship. <laughs> so, you know, like whatever people say that you can't do, like somehow God makes a way for it to happen. Right. Uh, and I had met some, I had met this dude that was there. He seemed like he was pretty cool. Uh, you know, I'm, I don't know nothing about the Bible. This is kind of new to me. I'm reading it. I'm learning things. I still got a lot of hatred, a lot of things that I'm dealing with. Uh, while I'm there, I read this book. It's called God Man It For Good by R.T. Kendall, right? And it's about the life of Joseph. And I'm reading this book, man, and it's breaking me down. It's very therapeutic, you know, like everything that I was going through. And I was like, man, this is me. And if, like, I'm going to have to forgive people, man, if I want to move forward, you know? 
I'm going to have to, uh, maybe God had a plan through this that I, that after all this, I'm going to be able to help some people out. You know, I don't understand all of it right now, but man, I was literally in my cell. Okay. Basically I'll, I'm in my cell breaking down over this book, you know, anyways, there's this other guy, older dude. He's trying to school me down too in the Bible. He tells me, Oh, I, I know this, this and that. All right, cool. Cool. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to learn. What's up? You know, he, he getting a little bit crazy trying to act like he's my dad, you know? And some of the other homies like, man, bro, you you let us know we will, we will book him, you know. And I'm like, nah, bro, you don't you don't got to do none of that, you know. Like, dude, dude, mean well. As far as I know, he means well, you know. I don't I don't know. Maybe he got some stuff he's dealing with, you know what I mean? Like, you don't got to do nothing like that to him. So I end up getting transferred to CMC. Before I go, everybody's like, bro, you better get off. I'm like, I'm not. How am I gonna get off? I'm Christian, bro. Like, I'm a, how am I gonna go over there and get off on somebody? Don't make no sense, right? So. I get there, you know, they're kind of expecting that a lot of the people there because they're used to people going there and checking the scene out and taking off on people. I get there. I run into the lady's husband who came visit me in juvenile hall. had no clue. I go out there for a visit. My grandma's out there visiting me. And uh, she says, hey, I've seen her out visiting. Her name's Cynthia, right? She says, have you met my husband? I was like, no, I didn't meet your husband. And she told me what cell he's in. And he's like two cells down from me. I'm like, man, that's crazy. That's God right there. Turns out he's leading the ministry on the yard. I'm like, wow. So he kind of taking his name's Ahmad Anderson, right? She she was a Hispanic. So I'm I'm thinking her husband was, you know, Mexican, but he he a brother, right? And so that kind of shocked me a little bit too. And I was like, oh, all right, cool. So I meet Ahmad and me and Ahmad kick it off. You know, he he good dude. You know, he starts he starts schooling me down the Bible. I got this other OG that came from another pen, and he's still trying to be like like he's my dad or something. I'm like, dude, you like you ain't my dad, right? Uh, end up, end up moving in the cell with the dude, and this dude was trying to school me down crazy, bro. Like, get up at three in the morning. He's like, he had all these rules for being a Christian, right? So he would get me up at three in the morning with him, and I had to read the Bible with him at three in the morning. We had to do certain things, <laughs> and it got to the point where it was pretty much violence, you know. Uh, I had to, I had to get out of there. I ended up moving cells. Um, and there's a whole other story and testimony around all that stuff. The dude, the dude tried to do me some dirty stuff, some politics stuff. But, uh, you know, God, there's a scripture that says, you know, how's uh, it going? Isaiah 59. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Right. But it doesn't say that weapon won't be formed. Right. So sometimes there's going to be a weapon formed against you. And it may look like something's going to happen, but God's going to take care of it. Right. And so this person, uh, was kind of a weapon but it also it also in my head i was still like i'm innocent man i shouldn't even be in here i'm going to the law library i'm i'm, I'm hitting the law books i'm trying to figure out a way to get out I'm trying to figure out things out right and i'm not trusting in god and so it kind of was a test at the same time that kind of refined me in that moment you know so it started telling me like basically it was like god telling me like dude just let that go you're here you gotta accept it you know there's a saying that the, like they tell a little boy, stand down, uh, sit down. And he sits down, but he says, in my heart, I'm standing up. And for me, I was, I was sitting down. I was doing all the right motions, but in my heart, I was still standing up in a lot of things. Right. And I had to learn that I had to forgive some people and I had to trust God that even though this 14 year sentence, I had to do all of it. Like I, I need to trust God that God's got a plan for me. Like I read in Jeremiah 29. Right. And so, I got through that whole realization right there. I met a bunch of brothers right there that had came down from the foreyard and other prisons that were youngsters like me that had became Christian, right? Tony, Tony Perez, uh, he was from 18th street, uh, uh, Ray Aguilar from Long Beach, uh, Roy, uh, Raul, a bunch of other brothers, man. We formed like a little pack of brothers, young brothers. We we're all youngsters. Most of them had a life sentence or, or over 10 years working out together, going to Bible study together, going to Bible college. I didn't have a GD or high school diploma, but these brothers inspired me, you know, like, man, you getting a GD, bro? You got a life sentence? Like, I'm going to go get a GD. I went and got my GD, all right? And, uh, and I just learned. I learned so much from so many older dudes at that prison. Like I told you, I told you before, I don't know if that was on the recording, but I, I met uh, Bruce Davis, one of the Charles Manson family. That dude is one of the most solidest and humblest Christian dudes that I know he's, he is, teaches, is he still alive? He's, he's still alive. alive. I, I write him a couple times here and there. I need to write him again. Uh, he's in San Quentin, I believe. Uh, the last letter I got from him. Uh, uh, 
uh, uh, Tony Chavez, like all these dudes, all these all these dudes that had life sentence, been in there 20, 30 years, Patrick Griffin, like they had learned from their ways. Maybe they were messing up for the first 20 years in prison, but the last 10 or 20 years, they were they were getting it right. Ahmad Anderson, Ray Lara, and like so many brothers. We had a we had like a bond right there. Ray Silva uh, from all kinds of different neighborhoods all across California, you know, and we, we were getting we were getting the Bible together, man. Uh, things were looking good. I was there. Things were good. You know, I was trying. I got my GD. My next goal was to go to Bible college, you know, because I was like, man, I'm on. These brothers are going to Bible college. They got a life sentence. They don't know if they're ever getting out. Like, I got a date. I can do something. Bruce Davis had like a like a doctorate degree. You know, I would ask him all kinds of questions because I don't know nothing about school. You know, I didn't apply myself. So I get locked up there. <laughs> they come get me, right? They pulled me in the program office. They And, and um, before I got there, the first couple of days I got there, all these guards came into my cell. And they're not supposed to be in your cell. They came in there threatening me, telling me I don't deserve to be there. Somehow they had ties to my victim's family, right? Uh, and so they're over there trying to get crazy with me and tell me stuff coming in my cell. And they kind of died down. But all of a sudden, I get pulled into the program office in cuffs. And they say, we're gonna we're locking you up for a uh, threat to the safety and security of the institution. There's somebody involved in your case there works here and they feel threatened by you. And I'm like, wow, are you serious? I was like, look, check it out, man. I don't even care if it's the dude that testified against me and said some lies. I don't even care, man. I'm like, I ain't gonna hurt him. I'm on a different trip now. You know, I'm not even messing with that stuff. They're like, it doesn't matter. We're locking you up. And they wanted me to sign this paperwork saying that I was okay. I'm not signing it. I said, I'm not signing nothing. You can send me the whole, do whatever you want to do because you're gonna do it anyways. But I don't got a problem even if it's the guy who testified against me and said some lies. You know, I'm cool. I forgive them. They took me to the hole. I sat in the hole for a few months, and then I got transferred to Solidad, North Yard, in 2003. I believe it was July 2003. I get to North Yard. Uh, it's a level three. Um, I think it had been a level two before, but they had they had moved on mostly level threes and fours over there. Uh, and so uh, when I was there, it probably was on lockdown the most in the whole state of California. Uh, they even did a documentary on us uh, with PBS. This one right here, uh, An Ideal World. Uh, so they, they, there was a bunch of stuff going on there. And, you know, I got plugged right in. As soon as I got there, I found some other brothers. And uh, and I kept doing my thing, man. You know, watching the riots go on, watching the stuff go on. I had to make my stand everywhere I went. You know, people want to hear my paperwork, slide underneath the door. These are the reglas, not slide them back. Look, man, this is what, this is what I'm going to do, man. I'm Christian. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to stay out of trouble, you know, and uh, that's it, you know. And and uh, for the most part, everybody pretty much respected that. Let me do my thing. You know, sometimes I have some people that they're straight haters, like, man, you're taking a, you're taking a bed space for a rider. You know what I mean? You 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 shouldn't be here. You should just go to a G, uh, uh, SMY yard or PC yard, whatever they're called now, Uh and I was like, no, nah, I'm not going nowhere, man. This this is what I'm this is what I'm gonna do, you know. And uh, you know, sometimes I had shot callers come to me and be like, Danny, man, anybody give you a problem? You let us know. I, I'm not gonna tell them nothing, you know. People would see things, but like God, I felt like God was navigating me through the whole system, man. Like, like everywhere I went, there even some people that would try to try to start some stuff, you know. And next thing I know, you know. I would see them get rolled up or something would happen to them. You know what I mean? They'll get caught up in a riot or something. I'm like, man, God, God ain't no joke, man. You read, start reading this Bible, this Bible start coming alive to you. You know, you start reading Psalms and you see all the stuff that David went through. And uh, when he was hiding from Saul, God was protecting him everywhere he went. And he delivered Saul into his hands a bunch of times. And David still did not touch him, right? Because, because he was a man after God's own heart. And he knew that God had anointed him, even though he was disobeying God and whatever he was going through, like, David kept doing stuff, and he hid David when he needed to hide him. And so I felt like God, God uh, protected me and kept me safe and gave me favor with the people that he needed to give me favor with, man. And, you know, uh, so I saw that North Yard. I was in all the buildings. Uh, Whitney B. Shasta uh, ended up being in Toro Dorm right before I left. Um, you know, like I said, there's nothing but riots and bunches of stuff. A lot of crazy things going on. Uh, I'm there, and I think it's 2004. 2004, my little brother, my little brother's been in and out the whole system. You know, I set a bad example for him. And, you know, he has his own choices, but I was, I set a bad example, you know, he's going in and out. And when, when I got locked up, when I was in juvenile hall, you know, I didn't know if I was ever going to see my little brother again. 
he was going to go to Helicon Youth Centers in Riverside. That's where they were sending him. I remember they put us in the juvenile hall in the uh, the yard at nighttime to let us say goodbye to each other. Right At that time, I didn't know if I was going to spend the rest of my life in prison. And I just remember crying, man. It's like, damn, I might not never see my little brother again, man. I gave him a hug, you know, and I told him, man, bro, do what you got to do. You know, stay out of all these places, man. And uh, I never thought I, I don't know if I was going to see him again, you know. Uh, six years later, or whatever that was, 2004, he rose up to saw that. Everything that I had influenced him in, had been a part of, he was trying to do a little bit more. And, uh, you know, they bring him off all the fish onto the yard. He's in the front of the line <laughs> with a big old smile. Like he's like he made it somewhere, you know. And uh, my celly at that time, before my brother came, it was weird, man. I had a dream that my brother came to the prison. And I had a dream that he was with certain certain northerners, right? And, you know, they come pick him up when they're uh, new arrivals. And, uh, and, I, and, and then I had a dream. Uh, uh, anyways, I had, I had a dream that he was, that, that he came to the yard, right? Next thing I know, he's at the yard and he's at the front and it would match exactly as my dream. And I'm, I'm taking laps around the yard with my celly, you know, we're, we're working out and stuff. And I see, I run around, I see him and my, my celly's up there in the front by the canteen. Uh, and he sees him too. And he looks at me and we both look at each other and like, damn, that's crazy. Like, the stuff that you know, I won't go into details of all the other stuff because there's some other stuff in that dream that happened, but it that stuff happened right that happened that day, uh, and some of the days previous before he rolled up on the yard. And so, both of us just looking at you like, Wow, that's crazy! So now, my brother's on the yard with me, I'm walking around with my brother, uh, you know, I'm trying to reach my brother, you know, before I, before I left the juvenile hall and he he left back then, I was like I said, I was. My brother, right? And I had a good connect. And he told me, he's like, bro, he's like, give me the connect. I'll take care of your packages and everything where you locked up. Don't worry about nothing. I got you. And I was like, bro, I'm serious. Bro. I made some changes, man. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. And I wouldn't give him nothing. And I know he felt like like I should have given him but I wouldn't. I said, you'll see, bro. You'll see. I'm going to stick with him. He said, man, you going to get out, fool. You going to go back to running around these streets, man. This is just this is, you don't get this life sense or you get out of <laughs> I was like, nah, bro, I didn't even do it. And he said, nah, you kill that fool out bro. I'm telling you, man, I did not kill that dude. They freaking did me dirty, bro. And 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 that was in June Hall. Now he's seen me six years later inside prison and doing what I said I was going to do, right? And so we're on the yard together. And now it gets to the point where the Northerners tell my brother, you can't talk to your brother no more. You cannot talk to your brother no more. We don't want you hanging out with them. And if you decide you want to become Christian or you want to do any of that stuff, you know, you know what's going to happen. And so him and uh, some of the uh, those dudes came up to me at the Christian table with him and basically made him tell me that. So I just told him, you know, I was, I was messed up feeling. I'm like, man, I brought my brother into this. I'm the one who schooled him down. I'm the one who talked, brought him about this life. I know he had his own choices, but you trying to tell me that you're his homeboy? And you're his real brother. You ain't. I'm blood. Like, we're blood. You know, in my mind, I didn't say nothing. But there was a part of me that was still like, man, I know who the who the Yavero is. I know who that. I should, I'll go to take off on him. <laughs> you know, your mind still, just because yeah, you're Christian doesn't mean, doesn't this stuff doesn't go through your head. You know, you, you're used to a certain way of lifestyle. And so there was a big temptation because I was like, man, how can these people tell me or tell my brother that he can't talk to me? You know, and my brother, I could see it in my brother's face. And I just told him, look, bro. Just do whatever they tell you you need to do and do your thing and get out of here and don't come back. You know, he was he had like 18 months. I don't know. He didn't have he always got a little sentence, you know, 14 months, 16 months, 20 months, whatever. I said, just do what you gotta do, bro. You're gonna get out soon. So it got to the point where we couldn't talk no more in the yard. Only only a couple of the homeboys will come around when none of the, nobody else is around and let him talk to me. Right? So they wouldn't get in trouble. And then it got to the point that when my family would come visit us, we would just go out there to the visiting room. And we would stay out there even when they left so we could chop it up a little bit and then go back. So we're sneaking conversations on a mainline GP yard because of my faith and because they're telling him he can't talk to me no more. And so it, 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 would, just, it would just mind blowing, man. And I just looking at everything, just, man, how twisted is this, you know? And then look at us. We're having a family reunion on the prison yard, man, me and my brother, you know? Crazy, bro. That's, that's crazy psycho, man. 
you know what I think we're going to have to do, Danny? We're going to have to do a part two. Okay. We're going to have to do a part two because I got to get going by one. Okay. Uh, I gotta pick up the wife. But what yeah, I want to cool. do before we end here, bro, man, this story is crazy. So we're going to end right there, bro. Like that's like a dramatic cliff, you know, with your brother. That's insane, bro. I'm like all the stories I've heard on. I never heard that ever. Oh, you should have seen it, man. The whole the whole yard was tripping. Like people people didn't want us to be talking, and then other people were coming to me. You know, I don't know if this is being recorded right now. So yeah, yeah, put this it part is. in there. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, it is. It still yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. It's still, we're still recording. We're still okay, recording. Gonna, but uh, I guess it, I guess after. it don't matter. Hold on till after, matter. though. We can hold on till after. But what okay. I want to do right now is before we go, before we stop recording, I want to um. I want to say, man, how do people reach you right now? How do people reach you? And, um, man, they want to do an interview with you. They want to, you know, know more about your organization, man. Plug that right now, brother. And then we're, we'll come you back next week, hopefully, for a part two. If that's cool. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, they could just email me. Keys to the number two, life outreach at gmail.com. They could just email me. Um, or you can get at me through YouTube. I got a YouTube channel, Keys to Life. Same thing, keys. The number two, life. Uh, I've been putting videos on there when I have time. I have a full time job, so I don't, I don't, I don't get to dedicate all the time that I would like on here. Uh, but you can, you can reach me through that Gmail, and uh, and we can connect. You know. You got an Instagram or no? I do have an Instagram. It's uh, it's uh, OG underscore Danny Contreras. OG OG, Danny Contreras. OG don't stand for original gangs. It stands for opportunity giver. All right, man. Yeah, man. Hey, you guys, we're gonna cut the interview today, man. We just ran out of time, man. It's been a it's been a good ride, man. But we're gonna leave off right there where his brother and him are on the yard. They can't talk. They're ordered not to talk. They're sneaking in combos. What a way to stop, man. To have a cliffhanger for the next one, bro. But Danny, I want to thank you for coming on, bro. And uh, dude, just thank you so much, brother. Thank you, bro. Thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, man. So with that, guys, hit the thumbs up, subscribe, and hit that notification bell, man. And follow Keys to Life, man. If you want to get in touch with them, you know what to do. Do that email. One more time, Danny. Keys to Life Outreach at gmail.com. All right. Keys to Life. The two, right? The two. Yes, number two, not T-O. The number two. Keys to Life. All right, guys. Have a good one. God bless you. God bless you.